all there in person in Bonn. Thank you for joining this side event, as uh, Tekla said, on coordination and collaboration on ocean-based climate action towards sustainable development. My name is Steve Whittacombe from Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK, and I will be the moderator for this event. Uh, as you'll see, we have an impressive selection of speakers, and I'd like to quickly remind everyone to please try and stick to the five or set to seven minutes to allow time for everyone and hopefully one or two questions at the end. Before we start, I would like to quickly thank, you, thank the uh, co-organizers of this session, namely the Global Ocean Forum, the Ocean uh, Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, the World Ocean Network, and Nausicaa, and my own organization, Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I would li now like to give the floor to Peter Thompson, the United Nations Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Ocean, for a special address. Peter, you have the floor. Greetings to everyone present, and thank you for the opportunity of addressing you on the subject of coordination and collaboration on ocean-based climate actions towards sustainable development. I hope to meet with many of you when I come to Bonn for the UNFCCC Substa Ocean Climate Dialogue on the 15th Tecla, of June. there's no sound. As you may know, I'm the UNSG's Special Envoy for the Ocean. And one thing has become crystal clear to me in the course of my work. That is that it's well within our capabilities to stop the decline of the ocean's health when it comes to control of pollution or establishment of marine protected areas the rationalization of the fisheries and shipping, shipping sectors, or the establishment of a robust and operable high seas treaty for the benefit of all. And I'm confident that all this will be achieved within the eight remaining years of SDG 14. But the real rot, the insidious long-term cause of decline, lies in the ocean's acidification, deoxygenation, and warming with all the measurable and projected consequences thereof, including inexorably rising sea levels, the death of coral reefs, changing circulation patterns, and massive biodiversity loss in lakes, rivers, wetlands, coastal areas, and the ocean wide. Therefore, I spread the message, wherever and whenever I can, that the true nemesis of the ocean's health, and thereby our own, the monster we ourselves have created that will destroy our species if we do not destroy it first, is the thickening cloud of greenhouse gases with which we are blanketing this planet. I'm sure you're all aware that the ocean has greatly slowed the rate of climate change on land, but we now know that this has been at great cost to the ocean's health. Its majestic beauty and power will live on forever, but as the ocean gets hotter, sourer, and ever higher, there will be momentous consequences for life as we know it on planet Earth. And so we find ourselves in the critical years of forcing remedial progress on reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions in order to meet the Paris Agreement, of improving ocean governance and protection and sustainable management in order to meet the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals, of committing the trillions of dollars required to achieve a truly sustainable blue economy and of creating science-based policies resulting from the global ocean observations and projections of ocean physics, chemistry, and biology implicit in the UN decade of ocean science. We have long been calling for the ocean to be better integrated into the climate system, specifically into UNFCCC mitigation, adaptation, and financial processes, including nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, and the global stock take. To achieve this, we took great steps forward at COP26 in Glasgow with the Glasgow Pact calling for greater integration of the ocean into the UNFCCC processes. We now have to make good on our words. As John Kerry often says, a climate meeting is an ocean meeting. And of course, the reverse is true. Therefore, I look forward to the ideas that will be exchanged at next week's UNFCCC Substa Ocean Climate Dialogue and to finding the innovative solutions to these problems at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon at the end of this month. These will lead us to the UNFCCC's COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh in November, where we should expect to see the climate finance needle move decisively in the direction of adaptation, particularly for the benefit of developing countries, 
as well as exponential transformational investment into the sustainable blue economy, the future of human security. I look forward to seeing many of you at all three of these vital global gatherings and to join with you in forcing progress. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter, for the excellent address uh, and for all your amazing work as well, not only for the oceans, but for the communities that depend upon those oceans for their health and well-being. Next, it's, uh, I'm greatly honoured to have our next speaker live here with us, uh, Vladimir Mayabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Inter Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and Assistant Director General of UNESCO. Vladimir will focus on an IOC UNESCO perspective on the opportunities for ocean-based action and the role of the UN Ocean Decade. Vladimir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and you know, uh, you can go st straight to the next slide because you already announced uh, uh, what I'm going to speak about. Uh, so please, uh, next slide. And, you know, uh, indeed, you know, I uh, have to say that uh, uh, IUC is, of course, uh, developing a whole value chain of different activities, from observations to research to data management, uh, a contribution to assessments, real-time services, contribution to governance, capacity development. Uh, I have to say that there was recently a moment of truth for all, all of us, and that is the report that we're going to discuss very soon at the Executive Council of IUC that is called the State of the Ocean Report and we uh, were able to as assemble uh, this year just the pilot uh, copy of that. This is the first ever report because, you know, it was crit critically clear for us that uh, we need to uh, inform the world, you know, and the passionate uh, intervention by Peter Thompson actually shows that, you know, we need to do something, but, you know, the whole motivation should come from knowledge. So, you know, that report that we're going to present uh, to the Executive Council and then to the world and then to the uh, con conference in Lisbon is uh, uh, of what is happening really in the ocean. And I took from that report several, uh, and I know still that you also participated in, in that report, but I took something else. You know, I took uh, 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 the input of to the ocean of nit nitrogen, of phosphorus. I took uh, an image of, that shows uh, the plastic uh, uh, distribution in the ocean and uh, also uh, an issue of sea level rise. You know, so the pollution is unabated. You can easily see. So, you know, the, the upper curve is what is the pollution that goes into the rivers and the and the blue curve, curve below below shows what's happening in the ocean and you know this is basically one of the very few uh, estimates that were so quality quantitative you know i think you know we are suffering from still very qualitative knowledge of the of the state of the ocean and that knowledge uh, really hampers uh, what we can do so we need to move, uh, make a decisive, a decisive step towards a quantitative description of what is happening in the ocean. That would be two-dimensional. I would say three or four-dimensional, and then we will be able to, to move forward. But you know we have handicaps. Next slide, please. So IUC is also responsible for uh, uh, analyzing uh, the capacity of ocean science. And we published two uh, global ocean science reports, 2017, 2013. And 20, and from those reports uh, in the map that uh, that is quite peculiar, you will see that this was an analysis of the uh, publication capacity of different parts of the world. We have three centers of power that will be North America, Europe, and, and East Asia. But you know, Africa is almost not there. Africa is not publishing. It also shows that Africa is unable to benefit from the from the knowledge that is generated in the ocean. So and the all the agenda that uh, Peter Thompson spoke about is really ocean science intensive. And the reason for that is this, uh, is the number that you see. The number is 1.7%. That is the contribution of the overall science, the uh, funding to overall science in the world to the science that's de uh, devoted to the ocean. With that, we have what we have. You know, this is nothing but natural. Next slide, please. So, you know, we, uh, we have to uh, uh, manage the ocean. For that, we have to measure the ocean. And that is an analysis of the sustainability of, of, uh, of uh, different networks. In the meteorological world, when there is a convention, the World Meteorological Organization, we do not uh, expect problems with uh, almost 70% of networks. And for the ocean, it's less than 30%. We do expect problems with more than half our networks in two, three years to come. And that assessment was done even before 
the uh, the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. And that is exactly why we needed to, to change the situation. And that was the idea of uh, creating the Decatur Portion Science for Sustainable Development. That is uh, not, definitely not a convention, but at least for us, it's a, a platform for moving together on many, many aspects of uh, ocean research and activities, focusing on how we can deliver to sustainable development. So, you know, I think it's very important to say that uh, uh, nothing is really uh, separate. You know, we cannot just only work on pollutants or only in ecosystems. Everything is coming together. I would say very much on the, the notion of ocean economy and very much this ocean economy in all estimates shows that, you know, uh, the ocean economy is highly dependent on the solutions in the in the climate domain. If the climate is now, uh, if the global warming is progressing, and all the elements of acidification, dehydration are progressing in the pace that we, that 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 we observe now, then the perspectives of the ocean economy are much slower than uh, uh, are analyzed in, for example, in uh, OECD reports and many other reports. Next slide, please. So you know, with that. Uh, 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 platform now, the decade, we issued three calls for actions. The third call is open now. Now, uh, I think tomorrow, uh, at the World Oceans Day, we are going to announce the new arrivals of decade programs. So what is really important here to realize? That uh, this is already the largest ever undertaking in the ocean science. That undertaking is uh, is going to require now uh, more programs, and we are going to have 45 programs, uh, 53 contributions, and 157 projects. You know, uh, I'm a physical oceanographer, but you know what is really different in the decade is that not only hard science, not only observations, not I would say not only technocratic science. This is the science of societal that brings together such ideas as empowering women, that uh, creating a, a network of uh, early career ocean professionals, creating empathy for the ocean, democratizing the ocean, creating equitable output of, of different programs. And that makes huge difference because only with this higher moral approach, this fair and honest approach, we can make big difference. Next slide, please. So I think the conclusion that uh, it, it was for me a, really a moment of truth, we need to really uh, explain to the world that what we know about the ocean is uh, insufficient for driving uh, uh, solutions. And that is because the investment in the ocean science is also drastically insufficient. We have to move forward with the ocean decade, having the platform that, that we have. And for that, we have to have a common idea. And I would like to suggest to you uh, uh, that common idea. For substance, it should resonate, I think. So, you know, we need to create a theoretical basis for sustainable ocean planning and management that will be working for all the uh, critical uh, pillars of our development. That will be ocean climate nexus, conservation of ocean biodiversity, life in the ocean, and sustainable ocean economy. They all naturally come together. If we learn how to decarbonize ocean management practices, create science foundation for that, and on the basis of that foundation, we'll start implementing ocean management, having in mind conservation of life in the ocean, means ocean health, also ocean climate nexus, and generating money in an equitable way. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Vladimir. Not only for such a fantastic presentation, but also for your continued leadership and, and advocacy and championing for the ocean. It's, it's, it's really inspiring stuff. Um, next, I'd like to introduce someone who plays a key role with regards to the ocean and climate at the UNFCCC. And I'm also very grateful that she's able to join us live in Bonn at the venue itself. I would like to give the floor to Joanna Post, the Ocean Focal Point and Program Management Officer at the UNFCCC. Joanna will be talking about the ocean and fulfilling the Glasgow Climate Compact. Thank you, Joanna. Over to you. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I'm representing the whole panel here in 3D, so <laughs> I'm f feeling, feeling the virtual presence of my other, other colleagues on the panel. Um, yeah, I want to ask a question. Anybody read the UNFCCC convention in this room from start to f end? <laughs> okay, 
first, first task homework. Um, so the, the convention, uh, if you go back to read the convention, Article 2 talks about the ultimate objective of the convention, which is to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And if you read the definitions in the convention, the climate system is defined as the totality of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and geosphere and their interactions. So it's not just about atmospheric GHGs, it's about GHGs in the whole system, or when it comes to the ocean specifically, um, you know, the impacts of those, uh, that warming on the ocean and the impacts of the carbon dioxide absorbed. So it's, it's, it's interesting that way back in, in uh, 82, uh, the climate system was defined as including the ocean, but then the ocean was pretty much ignored for a, for a long while. Even though if you look at the commitments uh, from the convention, it talks about promoting sustainable management, promoting cooperating conservation and enhancement of sinks and reservoirs of GHGs, including oceans. We all know that atmospheric GHGs have gone up since then, so we haven't done our job yet. We all know the impacts of the GHGs or the ocean warming on the ocean. Um, in Cancun in uh, 2010, there was a, that's when people started talking a lot more about adaptation and the recognition of risks of climate change and loss and damage. And again, ocean came up in those conversations. Ocean acidification was mentioned for the first time as well as loss of biodiversity, which of course is, is not just a, a land-based issue. And then we came to Paris in 2015, um, a minor miracle, but all parties agreed that they would, again, ensure the integrity of all ecosystems, including the ocean, as part of their commitments to the Paris Agreement and the protection of biodiversity. Time moved on. <laughs> and um, the science is pretty clear. The ocean drives the climate system. We should be talking about the ocean a lot more than we do under the UNFCCC. Um, I've been saying that to people for a lot <laughs> over the last few years, and many of you online and in the room have probably heard me say the same thing. But it was not really until the special report on the ocean and cryosphere came out from the IPCC in 2019 and the COP25 in Chile that parties really stood up and started taking notice of the need for action. Vladimir talked about the need for funding and we need a lot more research and observation, but parties are now talking about the need for action, not just on climate change, but on this sort of um, nexus between the ocean and climate change. At, at uh, Chile, the parties mandated a, the first dialogue, our ocean and climate change dialogue. Um, the Chile Madrid was uh, pre-COVID, so we were all expecting it to happen six months later. Parties were very interested. Um, we had a lot of submissions. On the silver lining for me that year was that um, due to the delay of that dialogue, um, due to COVID, I had a lot more time to put all that information together <laughs> and plan for the first ocean climate dialogue, which eventually took place at the end of 2020. And coming out of that, uh, that meeting um, was really some very key messages to parties about how we strengthen ocean climate action, not just in terms of process, but in terms of national action, in terms of synergies across the UN, um, as well as in terms of support for that action. Uh, we took all of that information to Glasgow, and in Glasgow, parties had for the first time a setting in uh, a decision, as in the overarching decision, the Glasgow Climate Pact, this strength in ocean climate action, and that strength of uh, ocean climate action under the process itself, not just in terms of the work uh, that's done by observers, and many of you I know are strongly working on it from the, from the global climate action point of view, but parties actually um, recognize the need to bring this information under this blue zone area, if you like, um, to encourage work streams and constituted bodies across the climate change um, work to, to consider ocean in their work, and there's, there's um, already work going on by uh, the adaptation team and linking opportunities for, for bringing in uh, knowledge around ocean climate action into adaptation work. The technology team are looking at how to strengthen uh, technologies in, in coastal zones, and a recent uh, standing, com um, standing Committee on Finance uh, forum over the last year, or the first part of it at least, looking at ecosystem-based um, adaptation ecosystem-based action funding also uh, included this. So it's, it's coming in, 
Um, and that work is being strengthened by across the board. One of the other outcomes from Glasgow, um, and I have the slide here, so please take note and come along next Wednesday or listen online if you, if you cannot be here in person, is the first mandated ocean and climate change dialogue under the UNFCCC process. Again, we inv um, the substitute chair invited parties and, and uh, non-party stakeholders to provide submissions to us so we could get the, get the focus right for this. And I think these dialogues are really an opportunity to look at what is needed the next step in strengthening this, this pathway towards ocean climate action and strengthening mitigation action and adaptation action in this very complicated space, in this space where we have to think about biodiversity, we have to think about marine spatial planning, we have to think about climate action, um, extreme events, um, as, as has already been said, you know, what is happening in, in different areas and, and the impacts that climate change has in the ocean from acidification to sea level rise to wavelength change and so on. Um, so, so it's a very complicated conversation and we need to think of it in a synergistic, holistic way as part of the UNFCC conversations and as part of a wider UN conversation as well, which is why from this dialogue we'll be taking that conversation to the UN Ocean Conference and talking about how to blue the Paris Agreement um, in, in Lisbon. But next week the focus is really around what do we need to do, so what, what do we have? Uh, what, are, what do parties have? What's preventing them from bluing their NDCs? Where can we? Uh, where where is this um, action going to be pushed next? How can we enable that? And how can we bring that conversation then um, towards UNOC and then towards COP this year to really try and push this next step? Now that we have this very clear mandate, and very clear mandate meant we actually have some ocean uh, web pages on our website now. So please go and have a look at those as well. Um, and, and um, bring this opportunity much more in the, in the blue zone at the UNFCCC and encourage parties that you can blue your NDCs because that's the point at which action is recognized and can take place and encourage parties to, to also, the part of that finance, part of that conversation, I'm running out of time, thank you, Thekla, is, is, um, is then part of that enabling is also bringing the finance, the capacity building, the technology to enable that climate change action to, so that it is biodiversity positive. And I'll stop there, sorry, <laughs> and pass the floor back to Steve. You can see I get very excited by this topic. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that presentation and, and your excitement and passion for this subject as well. It's, it is much appreciated. And I think we're all certainly looking forward to the Ocean and Climate Dialogue next week, and we wish you every success with that. So. Um, Hand straight over. So our next speaker is Sarah Cooley, Director of Climate Science with the Ocean uh, Conservancy and Chapter Lead Author with the recent IPCC Sixth Assessment for Working Group 2, um, which our present, uh, presentation today will focus on. So Sarah, thank you for joining us and I shall pass the floor over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here to share the highlights of the assessment in Chapter 3 of the IPCC Working Group 2 report on oceans and coastal systems and their services. Marine heat waves are an emerging threat to ocean and coastal systems. Our chapter assessed that marine heat waves are becoming more frequent and more intense. These often kick off mass mortality events in coral reefs, seagrasses, mangroves, and other environments. Marine heat waves are projected to increase in frequency and spatial coverage in the future. In coastal environments, wildfire, drought, and flood are increasingly of concern. Conditions favoring wildfires have increased and they are projected to increase more. Not only do wildfires burn sensitive inland and coastal ecosystems, but they add ash and debris to coastal waterways. This changes surface runoff quantity and content into the coastal ocean. Wildfires also interrupt human activities, such as tourism. We've known for some time that under climate change, wet areas will become wetter and dry areas will become drier. Drought in the coastal zone forces more groundwater withdrawal, encouraging salinity intrusion, while severe rain events carry pulses of freshwater and terrestrial material into the coastal ocean. Sea level rise and erosion are some of the most obvious climate impacts on the coastal ocean. Sea level rise rates have accelerated along most coasts in the last three decades. Sea level rise is combining with severe storms to intensify flooding. 
This increases coastal erosion, shoreline retreat, and beach loss, as well as infrastructure damage. We are seeing increased flooding in coastal cities and settlements, which increases the pollution potential of flood events and causes cascading impacts to global trade. Human communities are using hard and soft engineered structures like seawalls and beach renourishment to cope. They are accommodating some flooding and relocating other activities. There are trade-offs involved with each of these approaches. They also have different lifetimes and limits. Severe storms were assessed across the report. Stronger hurricanes and cyclones have increased globally in the last 40 years, and many are making landfall more slowly. This increases the flooding from rainfall and damage to the built environment. Climate-related adaptation and impacts related to storms strongly interact with human behavior as well as financial and technical limits to adaptation. Several climate and non-climate drivers are interacting to affect water quality worldwide. These include coastal water use, salinity changes, nutrient levels, temperature, and acidity. Overall, the changes favor the success of a different mixture of marine and coastal species than humans are accustomed to, and conditions may promote harmful algal blooms and anoxic events. This can have many outcomes for humans, including decreasing seafood safety by favoring aquatic pathogens like Vibrio, promoting flood events that spread pollution and pathogens, and increasing toxicity of harmful algal blooms. Sensitive ecosystems, including corals, mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses, are being harmed by overlapping drivers, including heat waves, storms, biodiversity changes, and human development. From 2014 to 2017, extensive severe bleaching affected more than 75% of corals worldwide. Past about 2050, sea level rise will advance faster than these systems can adapt. Tipping points are approaching where these environments change so much that they can't really be restored. This means that the risk of overshooting 1.5 degrees Celsius warming includes the risk of fundamental ecosystem transformations for these iconic and endemic systems. The consequences of losing coral reefs include decreased coastal protection, decreased fisheries, and tourism. These coastal ecosystems are part of our nature-based solutions toolkit Sustaining these systems provides nursery for coastal species, water purification, and flood protection. The more we wait to cut greenhouse gas emissions, the more likely it is that these systems will be dramatically transformed within a generation. Fisheries and aquaculture are known to be affected by climate change. On average, marine species are moving poleward 60 kilometers per decade. This is changing accessibility of species for fishermen. Tropical locations are losing species, while subtropical areas are gaining species that are moving towards those cooler conditions. Warming is also causing seasonal events like spring reproduction of fish to happen three or four days earlier every decade. These changes interrupt the way species interact with each other. Some fisheries can adapt by traveling farther, but in many communities there's a high risk of social inequities that arise from climate-driven changes in fishing, especially related to species that indigenous peoples and local communities depend on. There's also an increasing risk of transboundary conflict if resource management doesn't take species shifts into account. Climate change is affecting people's well-being worldwide. There is very high confidence that climate impacts threaten coastal tourism infrastructure, submerged beaches and coastal attractions, and impact destination attractiveness, tourism demand, and recreation economies. Climate impacts have harmed people's mental health. There's higher rates of anxiety, grief, loss, fear, despair, and cultural loss related to extreme weather events in anticipation of other climate-driven events. The solution set has two parts. The first is mitigation. Both volumes one and two of the IPCC report show that there are more opportunities to save the ocean and coastal systems we depend on if greenhouse gas emissions are strongly cut. Already there's been progress. The second is adaptation. There are three groups of ocean-focused adaptation activities. They include making adaptations related to society and institutions, implementing new technologies, and using nature to create solutions. Successful solutions will address many problems at once, not just one problem. 
that will spread benefit and risk across groups with different privileges. Successful solution sets will also draw from all three groups of solutions. Finally, inclusive solutions co-developed with many stakeholders tend to be the most durable and successful. Thank you so much for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I'm now going to take the opportunity to, uh, to have my own intervention. So this is where I get to do my presentation. So Tekla, are you able to put my slide up, please? OK, thank you very much. Now, we've heard from a number of, uh, of speakers today that to meet the challenges that we are now facing, we're going to have to do things in a different way to how we have been doing them. And what I would like to do today is illustrate one way in which we can adopt a more transnational approach to deal with a particular um, stressor that we're, we're facing. Next slide, please, Tekla. And the stressor we've chosen is ocean acidification. For those of you who haven't come across this, um, this impact, this carbon dioxide impact before, uh, what is happening is the carbon dioxide that we are emitting into the atmosphere is not all staying there. We know that a significant proportion of that carbon dioxide actually enters our coasts and oceans and reacts with the seawater to create a number of biogeochemical changes that alter the chemical properties of, that wa of the water, in essence, making it more uh, more towards the acidic uh, side of the uh, pH scale. So what, I hear you say. Next slide, please. Well, first of all, this change is happening already, and we can see it happening. And it's happening at a rate that is, it is increasing. So this is now a considerably concerning change to the natural state of our oceans a natural state that hasn't seen this rate of change or scale of change for a considerable period of time. Next slide, please. Because carbon dioxide is, is essentially a natural element that occurs in, in, in the environment, organisms and ecosystems have evolved to incorporate CO2 and aspects of carbonic chemistry within their natural, um, natural way of living. The problem with that is that any sudden and dramatic change in that, um, that carbonate chemistry will have direct and significant implications for the way in which those organisms are able to operate. Next slide, please. Now, we know that ocean acidification is a problem that is happening globally. And in order to be able to understand the rates of change and the implications it was the, um, the international uh, scientific community came together in 2012 to start collaborating and understand this at a global scale with the formation of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, now GOAN. And what started as a, a, a small network of interested scientists has now grown into a network that consists of nearly a thousand scientists from over a hundred countries, all of whom are looking to work together to understand the impacts and the consequences and the rates of change associated with ocean acidification in our ocean. Next slide, please. But what we do know about the ocean is it's not a uniform environment. Uh, there, are, there, are regional and, there are regional changes, regional processes that create this spatial, uh, spatial heterogeneity all over the globe. So whilst ocean acidification be, can be considered to be a global phenomenon, it is clear that there are regional effects. And as we've seen before, it's at regional scales where the interaction between the ocean and the human communities that depend on the ocean are most likely to have the strongest linkage. Next slide, please. So what GOAN has done is it's tried to focus, not only does it look at things at a global perspective, but it looks to organize things at a regional level to allow regional hubs that are able to coalesce around those kind of aspects and, and concerns and issues that have a regional context. In, able to, in doing so, what we're able to do is therefore take the global pressures and issues of ocean acidification and apply them within a regional context, which might better support decisions and 
adaptations that will be applied at a local scale. Next slide, please. But Goan was really a representation of an academic community that had recognized the problem and had come together to try to better understand, and as, uh, as Vladimir pointed out, gain that quantitative understanding of how environmental stress was impacting on the marine system. What the ocean decade has done is challenged us as academics to think differently and to think not just about the cool science that we want to do because we inherently want to understand the system, but what is it that we are trying to achieve? And out of that change in, in approach came ORS, Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, the UN, de uh, UN Decade Endorsed Program associated around ocean acidification research. And through that, we actually identified seven key outcomes that we wanted to achieve by the end of the decade. So rather than just thinking about the cool science that we wanted to do, we wanted to, we wanted to first define what it is we wanted to achieve and then work backwards to understand the science we wanted to do, but also the other activities that would support the science in order to deliver those outputs, those outcomes. And you'll see, looking through the outcomes, that some of them are very dependent on interactions and, and um, collaborations with people far outside the academic community and require us to create networks and collaborations which go way beyond the, framework, uh, the boundaries of science. And I think that's very much in the spirit of what Vladimir was talking about in terms of the, uh, in terms of the ocean decade. Next slide, please. So what we've done to try and th deliver this is for each of those outcomes, we have identified some co-champions who will start to bring together the skills and expertise in order to deliver those outcomes. Their first job is to create a working group who will actually plan out the activities that we need to do to, in order to get to the desired outcome at the end of the decade. We've started to engage with the key experts and specialists that are, who are going to be needed to deliver that and understand the needs and capabilities of delivery partners as well as stakeholders and funders to create a kind of onion model whereby at the core sits the expertise of the co-champions, but outer layers bring together the skills and expertise in order to deliver this. Next slide, please. So what is it that ORS actually needs from people, particularly from governments and national bodies and partners? Well, we've already talked about the difficulties in, in obtaining the long-term support for national and regional networks for monitoring and reserving activities. We call for the investment in future R&D to enhance and increase observing capability and the data generation. We look to invest in capacity building and training to ensure that the, the science we generate and the activities we undertake is democratized so that the data generation is, is created and also applied in the places where it's most needed. We need to increase data availability and visibility for all stakeholders. And one of the key things, and which is why I'm so excited now that the oceans are getting the recognition they deserve, is that we need to effectively use these data and knowledge to guide, the, to, to guide effective decisions and legislation. So thank you very much. With, with that, I shall hand over to the next speaker. So it's with great pleasure that I, that I welcome our next speaker, which is Vicky Romero, the Project Officer uh, for Biodiversity and Climate Change with the IUCN an organization that we have had the pleasure of collaborating with now over many years. So Vicky, over to you, you have the floor. Uh, hi Steve, and hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so today I'll be discussing with you some opportunities for ocean action uh, through the global stock take of the UNFCCC. So we're going back to the convention and I think it's very interesting how it all uh, ends up being threaded and weaved into each other. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So as you probably all know, the global stock take, or if those from, those familiar for you will know it as GST, 
is the Paris Agreement ambition mechanism. It is designed to assess the collective progress made towards achieving the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement and to inform future action and ambition through the update and revision of the National Determined Contributions or, or NDCs. So we all know the ocean is the largest natural, natural carbon sink, is the primary regulator of the ocean of the global climate. We now know that protecting blue carbon ecosystems, uh, ocean developing ocean-based renewables, sustainable management of fisheries, uh, they all can significantly, significantly contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation and also to build resilience. So the global stock take now presents a, a great opportunity to highlight the role of the ocean in reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement. But it also presents an opportunity to ensure that ocean and coastal ecosystems are ingrained appropriately into the relevant processes of the UNFCCC. And also, even importantly, ensures that future actions will result in a healthy ocean that can help limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees uh, while providing protection and livelihoods to millions of people. So next slide, please. So you also probably know this, and this is just a quick review. The Global Stock Day has three components of phases and three thematic areas like you are seeing right now. So to really um, seize the opportunity presented by the Global Stock Tech for Ocean, it is important that the relevant information is considered at each stage of the global of this stock tech process. So for example, in the collection phase, through the NDCs and the synthesis report and the IPCC report, they can contain a wealth of information related to oceans that can be taken into account. But also, uh, the ocean can be present in methodological aspects of the technical assessment, which is now going to begin at this session of the subsidiary bodies of the UNFCCC. So um, while the scope of the global stock take is limited to the consideration of progress made by, by parties through their NDCs, so that means like it's bound by national boundaries, uh, it is also important to have a broader understanding of the whole ocean as part of the climate system and its role as climate regulator is indispensable. So, for example, the global stock take could evaluate how um, overall emission reduction commitments will reduce or will fail to reduce climate impacts in the ocean, including uh, ocean acidification, warming and deoxygenation. So, ultimately, uh, the, the presence or absence from the GST of ocean-related information and actions so far will give an indication of what is needed going forward. So we take stock, we move on. For example, for instance, there is a, if there is relatively little information in national reports and communications, then this provides an avenue, an indication of how to enhance uh, national-level action um, for, for ocean and in that regard. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, at IUCN with the RARE and WWF and Conservation International and others, we prepared last year a report identifying ocean actions that could be considered in the global stock take under each of the thematic areas and which source of input could capture that information. So here is just um, a small sample a very small sample. Uh, in, all, in all cases, we are suggesting, we suggested that these actions could be accounted for in the GST, like to take into account ocean action. And if they're not, then they could be thought of as elements to increase ambition in future NDCs. So uh, under mitigation, we, we know that ocean and marine and coastal ecosystems contribution to climate change mitigation is a crucial aspect to consider when assessing progress towards the implementation of the mitigation goal of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and this can be reflected in how blue carbon ecosystems like mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrasses are included in mitigation priorities and targets in communications by parties, or for example, in references if parties are implementing the IPCC wetland supplement. In adaptation, uh, ocean and coastal zones are 
inextricably linked to climate change impacts and risk and vulnerabilities, so coastal-related measures um, to be considered when assessing adaptation uh, include ecosystem-based measures to reduce coastal flooding, uh, enhance coastal security, ecosystem-based measures to protect and restore biodiversity, to build ecosystem resilience, um, nature-based solutions in fisheries or aquaculture, or hybrid, even hybrid green-gray approaches to coastal infrastructure. And finally, on means and implementation, when considering progress under this area, it's important to account, for example, uh, for the share of climate finance dedicated or directed at ocean and coastal-based solutions towards ocean science and research and capacity building. We know that under investing in, in ocean and coastal protection can exacerbate the adverse impact of climate change and undermine uh, efforts. Uh, so this is just to give you a flavor of how the global stock take could incorporate ocean information and then at the next stage for the consideration of inputs, it can provide recommendations on how to foster or enhance um, ocean climate action. So for more details, I invite you to read our paper on packing the global stock take. And uh, I look forward to the discussions that will take place at this session. And now that we embark on the technical assessment, I'm, I'm sure that will be lots to learn from this first global stock tech exercise and, and we'll see moving forward. So uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Vicky. Very, very, very interesting. Um, so uh, next we'd like to focus on uh, regional inputs, uh, starting with Christelle Pratt, who is the Assistant Secretary General Environment and Climate Action with the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. Christelle, Christelle had hoped to join us live, but has been called away in relation to the 114th session of the Council of Ministers, and so provide a, provided a video of her intervention. So Christelle, you have the floor. After the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the OACPS, I'm honoured to participate in this event and speak on the important topic of strengthening coordination and collaboration on ocean-based climate actions towards sustainable development. We know the ocean plays a critical role in regulating the Earth's climate system, and they are inextricably linked in so many ways. We know the ocean covers 70% of our blue planet and is a major driver of the global economy, carrying more than 90% of world trade and sustaining 40% of humanity that live within 100 kilometres of the coast on continents and islands. In recognising this and the burgeoning impacts of climate change, improved understanding of the ocean, of the ocean climate nexus, and of investing in operational ocean and climate observations, research and services, and of the feedback loops between the two will become ever more critical if we are to adapt and to mitigate the effects of climate change and restore ocean health and integrity for people, planet and prosperity, and importantly, to avoid a pathway towards peril. This will require a major sea change in attitudes and behaviour at all levels, and especially global level planetary scale action if we are to turn the tide on ocean warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, marine biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. Despite having played a negligible role in creating the now raging climate crisis, the vulnerable countries of the OACPS, including LDCs, landlocked developing countries and SIDS, already find themselves at the front lines of the impacts of climate change and they have and continue to pay a heavy price with no end in sight at this time. The frequency and intensity of hurricanes, cyclones, of droughts, of coastal erosion and saltwater intrusion is unrelenting and will continue as will sea level rise into the years to come. Although often overlooked, the ocean provides important solutions to addressing climate change and its consequences a healthy ocean is vital for climate change mitigation and adaptation. For example, 
science informs us that conserving and restoring coastal habitats such as seagrasses, salt marshes and mangroves, as well as their associated ecosystems, are critical in the sequestering of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at rates higher than terrestrial forests. And so we must invest and nurture these areas. Now is the time to establish an earth systems approach to decision making and to implement the policy pathways needed to ensure that all countries play their part in the sustainable use and conservation of the ocean and its resources, while assisting the most vulnerable to adapt to the effects of environmental degradation already underway. Some countries have already set ocean health actions as part of their nationally determined contributions, and some are already adopting integrated and holistic ocean planning policies and strategies that promote the long-term health and resilience of the ocean, while attracting investments and stimulating sustainable economic growth for their coastal communities and national economies. Some OACPS examples in Africa include Benin, Cabo Verde, Liberia, Seychelles and Sierra Leone, and there are others in the Caribbean and Pacific as well. OACPS regions have also developed and are implementing long-term regional policies and strategies to address climate change and resilience and sustainable ocean management, such as the Framework for Resilient Development in the Pacific and the Framework for Pacific Oceanscape, a catalyst for implementation of ocean policy. Such integrated approaches are needed now more than ever, given the urgency and the complexity of multiple, converging and layered issues and challenges confronting us. The OACPS, in partnership with the European Union, has had decades of experience in fostering cooperation and collaboration at member states, regional and intra-regional levels, and have together been leading proponents in global efforts to tackle global challenges and catalyze as well as galvanize action across ocean, climate, biodiversity agendas, processes, policies and practices. There is, however, still need and room for further strengthened coordination and collaboration for recognizing and embracing the synergies and links between climate and ocean communities of practice and for integrated approaches to be forged for striving toward an operational Earth observing system that serves all and leaves no one behind, for concerted efforts to put a stop to the harmful behaviours and practices that are harming the ocean and climate, both, for il illustrating the inextricable link between nature, economy and people, and realising that global cooperation and collaboration is the only way that we are going to solve the world's problems, together for the planet and for its people and nature to live in harmony again. But this will depend on ensuring strengthened links between science to policy to practices, to deliver the science we need to improve our understanding of the ocean, to regain the health, productivity and resilience of the ocean and its resources so that it can again benefit people and planet. We must be both precautionary and proactive in our approaches and our ambition and aspirations must match the challenge if we are to endure. We must continue to collaborate and cooperate at all levels and embrace multilateralism because the crisis we face are global. And while they may seem to affect some more than others, they will affect us all in the end. I thank you. Thank you very much for that, Christelle. Bernice McLean, head of the Blue Economy Department with the African Union Development Agency, will now provide an overview on cooperation and coordination on ocean-based mitigation and adaptation in the African region. Bernice, you have the floor. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be invited to participate in this event. And I'd like to thank the friends and colleagues from the Global Ocean Forum uh, for in inviting me to participate, um, albeit uh, from a remote basis. Um, I am coming here to you today from the African Union Development Agency, uh, part of the African Union, um, and I will talk to you today uh, on cooperation and coordination on ocean-based mitigation and adaptation 
in Africa. My name is Bernice McLean and I'm heading up the uh, Blue Economy um, Program and Unit at uh, the African Union Development Agency. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to go over um, a brief slide on the uh, points that I will uh, tackle within this presentation. I will start with an introduction to climate change uh, and oceans in the African region, um, then speak to, to Africa's guiding policy on oceans and blue economy, and then speak to the cooperation and coordination on uh, ocean-based adaptation to climate change uh, through the African uh, Union Blue Economy uh, Framework. Um, my uh, second last slide will talk to blue economy within the African Union Institutional Framework. Uh, and then I will end on some of the um, uh, issues that are uh, going to be discussed uh, at this event um, in Bonn, uh, dealing with African common positions on strengthening ocean-based actions. Right, so to begin with, um, to, to just give a, a very brief uh, background on climate change and oceans in the African region, um, in terms of the globe, as we all know, um, as the largest ecosystem of the planet and the most important carbon sink, um, the global ocean is a key factor uh, in enabling the world's populations uh, to adapt to climate change. Now, Africa is a continent that is deeply connected uh, to its five uh, diverse and highly productive uh, ocean areas. Uh, the continent is a maritime continent. It is bordered by um, over 48,000 kilometers of uh, coastline across 38 coastal and island states. Uh, now, this is around 70% um, of our, uh, our, our member states on the continent. Um, so really, it does give an indication of, of how close we are uh, to our ocean areas. Um, and as such, the, the coastal populations in Africa uh, benefit uh, hugely from coastal and ocean ecosystems. Um, that's both directly uh, for uh, goods and services, for food and nutrition security, uh, livelihoods and employment and the like. And then many more of the populations obviously uh, also benefit indirectly uh, from ocean-related industries, um, presenting uh, diverse opportunities uh, for economic development and social well-being. And these include industries such as maritime transport, uh, energy, um, oil and gas, um, tourism, uh, and uh, other extractive industries. Um, now, there's growing uh, awareness of the imperative for, for healthy oceans and coasts um, on the continent um, for the sustainable uh, economic growth um, to drive uh, global efforts to respond to climate change and also to face uh, the unprecedented challenges and impacts, um, such as uh, changes in um, sea level, uh, ocean acidification, uh, changes in water temperature that drive uh, biodiversity, um, distribution um, and the like, uh, ocean acidification, um, and uh, perhaps most uh, significantly um, at the moment is the increased uh, frequency and intensity of extreme events uh, such as coastal uh, storms. Um, now, this the, the awareness of the importance of healthy oceans and coasts um, has been growing rapidly over the last little while. Um, it's currently expressed at the highest level um, where Africa's blue economy is, is encapsulated in our continental vision, Agenda 2063, um, the Africa we want, um, and is a critical pillar uh, for development of the continent. Um, as a result, uh, there is growing uh, momentum and political will uh, to harness and utilize um, all of the potentialities offered by uh, Africa's aquatic areas um, for um, uh, building resilience as well as, well as building uh, livelihoods and the like uh, for our coastal populations. Now, in terms of the, um, the, the policy framework um, that, that guides uh, oceans and blue economy on the continent, um, we have, as I mentioned, um, the, the Continental Vision uh, document, uh, Agenda 2063, which, which incorporates blue economy very clearly uh, and um, uh, in a targeted way in Aspiration 1 um, of, the, of the vision. Um, and then we also have a number of uh, additional um, uh, more and more recent uh, strategy frameworks um, dealing specifically both with uh, blue economy development and, and climate uh, change. 
Now, two of those um, I'll, I'll refer to. Um, the one is the Africa Blue Economy um, Strategy, um, which was developed in 2019 uh, and adopted. Uh, its implementation plan is now under under the under implementation. And then we also have the the draft Africa Climate Change Strategy, which is still under discussion uh, and is um, gaining a lot of traction uh, through the various different uh, COP events and the like. Um, there are also a number of uh, additional, uh, more focused um, uh, policy frameworks dealing with um, uh, maritime strategies, uh, transport and security, um, as well as other um, blue economy related strategies dealing with uh, agriculture, um, fisheries and aquaculture, um, obviously, the Continental Free Trade Area um, Agreement that has recently been uh, operationalized um, has a lot uh, to do with um, trade in aquatic species and the like, um, and a number of additional ones which I won't go into too much detail about here. Um, now, from an institutional perspective, um, the African Union Development Agency, my agency, has, has also developed um, a blue economy program, uh, which is responsive to um, all of the above, and um, serves to to guide our implementation um, of the um, of these frameworks um, as an implementing agency for the African Union. Um, we are really guided uh, by these these uh, frameworks. So our Blue Economy Program really talks to how we uh, support member states and regional economic communities uh, to achieve the aspirations that are outlined in these uh, various different strategies. Um, just to speak very, very briefly on um, the incorporation of, of climate resilience uh, within the Africa Blue Economy Strategy, um, this really provides uh, guidance for cooperation and coordination on, on ocean-based uh, actions uh, for climate change um, through our, our strategy document. Um, the document is, is comprised of five thematic areas, and thematic area three uh, refers specifically, um, as you can see there, to climate resilience. Um, it recognizes the, the complexity um, of both the challenges and solutions um, around climate resilience uh, and the need for uh, multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder uh, um, engagement and interventions and actions um, to drive a coordinated uh, strategic solution uh, for uh, effective outcomes on, on climate adaptation. Now, as such, the, the Blue Economy Strategy uh, provides a really useful platform uh, for guidance on uh, action-oriented cooperation and coordination on ocean-based mitigation and adaptation for the continent. Um, while it is still new, um, a number of uh, stakeholder groups um, have convened and um, um, projects and initiatives are underway to, to deal with um, uh, the impacts of, of climate variability and change. Now, goal one of this thematic area three um, of the strategy speaks to climate resilience under the banner of environmentally sustainable and climate resilient economies and communities. Um, and while I won't go into detail, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen there, um, uh, under this goal one, uh, there are a number of uh, specific objectives, uh, six, six objectives that uh, detail um, the implementation plan around uh, this goal. Um, and there are a number of, of action items that have been outlined in our implementation plan. Um, now, within the, the, the institution... Okay, I'm sorry. we've had to finish that um, presentation slightly early because of the pressing time uh, constraints we have within this, uh, this event. If anyone would like a copy of the presentation to see the final two couple of slides, uh, please contact us and we'll provide that for you. But thank you for that intervention, Bernice. Um, our next speaker will focus on international collaboration on ocean climate issues through the Commonwealth Blue Charter. Jeff Ardron of the Commonwealth Secretariat is not only uh, leading on the Commonwealth Blue Charter, but was also instrumental in conceiving this initiative. And I'm looking forward to his talk. Jeff, you have the floor. Hello, my name is Jeff Ardron. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Commonwealth Blue Charter and some of the ways that we are supporting projects related to climate change, but in the ocean realm. 
I would also like to thank the University of Plymouth for inviting me to give this presentation. And I'm sorry, I couldn't be there in person. The Commonwealth is a very ocean related Commonwealth. 47 of our 54 countries border the ocean. Two thirds of all small island developing states are in the Commonwealth. About 45% of the global coral reefs and about one third of mangroves in the world are in the Commonwealth. On this map, you can see in dark blue, the Commonwealth countries. Um, of course, as you probably know, about 60% of the ocean is beyond national jurisdiction. But as I said, within national jurisdiction, over one third is in the Commonwealth. In April, 2018, countries gathered together for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, this time in London, and signed the Commonwealth Blue Charter. It, um, since that time, in the four years since then, has become the Commonwealth's flagship ocean initiative, and I will be um, discussing it a little bit um, in what time I have today. What makes the Blue Charter different is that it is country-led. It is country, um, they set their own targets. When we consulted with countries before we drafted the Blue Charter, they said, listen, all these um, commitments are great. We made these commitments in good faith, but please do not um, ask for more commitments in the Blue Charter. Rather, let's figure out a way that we can work together to address the commitments that we've already made and just work on helping the ocean and helping ourselves. So central to the idea of the Blue Charter are the action groups. The action groups are created by the countries and are led by the countries and countries can join them voluntarily. Our role as a secretariat is to help them. And I'll explain a little bit further how we do that. On this slide are the 10 Blue Charter action groups. Um, as you can see, they are all in some way affected by climate change. But in the upper right hand corner, we have a specific action group devoted to climate change being led by Fiji. But as I said, we view climate change as a cross cutting topic as well, one that impacts all of the Blue Charter action groups. We asked this question, um, and if this was live, we would do a live poll. How much of the Green Climate Fund do you think has been used to support projects with some ocean related elements? And I'll tell you right now, generally people think it's somewhere in the middle there between two and 20%. But actually it's less than 2%. So we have a problem here. The importance of the ocean to the planet, but also to our countries and to people is not being matched by climate funding. Although about 20 to 30% of published climate research is about the ocean, we're not seeing those kinds of numbers when it comes to financing our governments. So presumably scientists are getting 20 to 30% of the climate funding going to the ocean, but governments are seeing less than a 10th of that. It turns out that Sustainable Development 14 is the least funded of the SDGs. I mentioned the 2% figure for the Green Climate Fund, it gets worse. 1.6% 1 1 of official development assistance, half a percent from philanthropy, and one tenth of a percent from development finance is going to ocean related projects. Now, when this report came out three years ago, it was a wake up call, even for those of us such as myself who work in the ocean realm, we didn't really know how bad the news was until it had been all put together. And this report is still a wake up call and it's still sobering and the news hasn't really improved yet. So uh, I should add that um, the green, that some improvements have happened. Uh, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, for example, is the one big um, new fund that has now come in for the ocean. And there's some other smaller funds as well. But we're still facing a funding crisis for the ocean. So in November last year, we contracted a consortium of experts to help our countries uh, fill out 
climate funding with more ocean elements in them. Uh, we're applying for further funding to extend. It was just a pilot project that just recently ended, but um, it was very successful in five months. We helped five countries. Uh, we will be announcing this month in a couple of weeks time, our Blue Charter Project Incubator to support ocean climate projects as well as other projects. And we will also be seeking support from the heads of government at that heads of government meeting in two weeks time to uh, develop a new Blue Charter Action Fund. We have also been very busy on other fronts. We have trained more than two, uh, more than 400 officials from 40 countries. We have signed um, six formal partnership agreements and helped informally in develop many partnerships. We have eight and more online um, self-paced learning courses on various topics. We've compiled a database of training opportunities that's curated. We check to make sure that they're academically, uh, scientifically sound training uh, provided by third parties, and then we put them on our database. And we have more than 100 marine funding opportunities in our funders database. As I said, there's not a lot of funding out there, and what funding is out there is extremely competitive, but we do list it for our countries, hoping that maybe they'll be the lucky ones who get some help. That is it. I have run out of time. I didn't have a whole lot of time. But if you want to ask more questions, please do. Uh, my email is on this slide. You can also just Google Blue Charter or Commonwealth Blue Charter. You'll see how to contact us there. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry that I could not be there in person. Best of luck with the meetings. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that Jeff. And good luck with the upcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Um, so now joining us live from Japan, where it has gone well past midnight, uh, and so I'm incredibly grateful that she uh, has made the time available to us, is Miko Mayakawa, Senior Research Fellow in the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Miko, you have the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it is my great pleasure and honor to speak to you today. Um, I will be talking about climate change adaptation and migration with dignity uh, framework today. Um, this work is based on the joint research which was conducted in collaboration with the Environmental Law Institute, Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Foundation, the International Organization for Migration, and Dignity Rights International. First, I would like to talk about migration itself. People in the world move for multiple reasons. People move for improved employment opportunities in many cases. People also seek educational opportunities. Oftentimes, there's lack of opportunities for secondary, tertiary, higher education, um, in developing states and people move um, to seek uh, opportunities for those uh, for the um, educational op opportunities. Um, people also uh, seek um, health and medical services for himself or herself or for their family members. Also, environmental shocks and stresses drives um, people to migrate. Environmental shocks and stresses include climate change impacts such as tropical cyclones, droughts, and slow onset events such as sea level rise and land degradation. Although people tend to move based on a set of reasons, the impact by climate change is in fact intensifying. People are also forced to move due to conflict, violence, and persecution. According to the most recent IPCC report, which is AR6, um, it is uh, highlighted that uh, there is a great need to increase adaptive capacities to minimize the negative impacts of climate-related displacement and involuntary migration. It also goes on to say that enhancing adaptation improves the degree of choice under which migration decisions are made 
ensuring safe and orderly movements of people within and beyond countries. The scale of migration is on the increase. The term migrant is not defined under, under international law, but it refers to a person who moves away from their place of residence with a country or across an international border temporarily or permanently for a variety of reasons. In fact, international migration is surpassing 2050 projection by 2.6%, which is 230 million people. Major migration and displacement events have caused great hardship and trauma, including conflict in Ukraine crisis, currently Syria, Yemen, Democratic Republic of Congo, severe economic and political instability in Venezuela and Afghanistan, and climate and weather-related disasters in the Philippines, Bangladesh, India, the United States, and Haiti. We've also observed that COVID has radically altered mobility around the world. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, migrants, uh, previous slide, please. Migrants are, in fact, exposed to multiple challenges as they move. People often have challenges accessing documentation such as passports, visas uh, on a timely basis, information, various types of resources, and necessary assistance. Um, migrants oftentimes become victim, victims of discrimination, violence, assault, and human trafficking. As a result, a uh, record number of men, women, and children lose their lives while trying to reach other countries. Addressing the needs of migrants, recognizing the diversity of mobility pathways, and supporting a migrant's need um, to respond to crisis are essential for upholding human rights and dignity rights. However, uh, current legal and policy frameworks protecting the rights of migrants are not cohesive or comprehensive at all uh, worldwide. Next slide, please. Uh, therefore, um, there was a big uh, motivation for us uh, to conduct this study to develop a migration with dignity framework. The notion of migra migration with dignity was first coined in 2014 by then president of Kiribati, Arnold Deton. The idea was to see migration as a method of adaptation. And the intention was to equip Kiribati's population with the skills to enable a life equal or greater than what they had when they have to, in fact, migrate across borders when their islands become uninhabitable due to sea level rise and other climate change impacts. We have expanded this concept to identify the core needs of migrants to build a practical framework for policy application. Drawing upon a range of human rights and dignity rights, we identify the following six key dimensions under the framework for migration with dignity. First is freedom of movement. That is to say, the right to choose when to leave and when to return. Uh, secondly, security, namely the right to be free from violence, including sexual violence, human trafficking, slavery, forced labor, and arbitrary and abusive detention. Thirdly, equality, the right to be treated as a human being of equal worth, um, equal worth, including access to benefits, services, and legal protections. Fourth, right to a basic standard of living, including access to work and shelter. Fifth, access to services, which are healthcare, education, and legal services. And sixth, civil and political rights, including freedom of speech, religion, assembly, 
and political participation. Next slide, please. The application of the migration with dignity framework spans across the cycle of migration. Migration is not a linear process. It is uh, far more complicated. Uh, it involves departure, transit, um, arrival at destination, and also return. And uh, people might have multiple dis um, destinations and the process is, is quite complicated. And at every phase of migration, uh, these six um, dimensions are quite essential to be looked at. Uh, also, gender and social inclusion uh, aspect should be taken into consideration and pandemics and conflict. Uh, we think that um, applying this framework is essential also for building resilient communities um, at the receiving end. Next slide, please. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we believe that this framework is uh, complementary to the UN Compact on Migration um, by offering a practical model for addressing migration in a way that benefits migrants' origin and destination country. Uh, we hope um, to uh, increase awareness of the issue and the migration framework itself uh, for uh, further examination and application. And we uh, would like to continue to test this model and um, continue our research and share findings with the wider community. Um, the last slide, please. Uh, this work, in fact, can be found um, in the Journal of Disaster uh, Research, uh, which is an open access journal. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for that, Nico. Um, we now move on to the final presentation for the event. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we are have the pleasure of sharing a recorded presentation by Iwona Gin, who is head of European projects at Nausicaa and represents the European Ocean Coalition, uh, EU for Ocean Consortium, and the Youth for Ocean Forum. Iwona, you have the floor. I'm going to talk about the EU for Ocean Co Coalition that Nausicaa is a member of and how <clears throat> this coalition works towards increasing uh, ambition to reduce our global emission by 2030 through international collaborations on ocean literacy. The EU for Ocean Coalition for Ocean Literacy uh, assembles uh, organizations and individuals whose main goal is to save a future with a healthy ocean that sustains us all. They all contribute to spreading ocean literacy uh, and working towards better understanding of how uh, humans influence the ocean and how the ocean influences us. Uh, the EU for Ocean Coalition is an initiative that is supported by the Director General for Maritime Efforts and Fisheries of the European Commission. The EU for Ocean Coalition uh, connects organizations, projects and people uh, and uh, engages them in three communities, the EU for Ocean Platform, the EU for Ocean Forum and the Network of European Blue Schools. They are located in five sea basins, the Atlantic and the North Sea Basin, the Baltic Sea, the Arctic, the Black Sea Basin and the Mediterranean. And they work on the three main topics, ocean and climate, food from the ocean and healthy ocean. Uh, so the EU for Ocean Coalition uh, is, as I said, composed of three communities. Uh, the blue dots represent the members of the EU for Ocean Coalition. There are 130 organizations and about 270 experts. The brown dots are uh, members of the Youth for Ocean Forum. There are 230 of them and 133 are, have been accredited as Young Ocean Advocates. And finally, the green dots stand for the 38 blue schools, which, assembles, which assemble uh, 6,000 6, uh, schools. 
the EU for Ocean Coalition the, uh, spreads ocean literacy and aims at supporting changes in perception, values, attitudes and behavior towards more sustainable practices and management of the ocean. And its activity are uh, mainly the diversity basin events, the ocean literacy festivals, joint campaigns, and three working groups that work on three main topics and um, where uh, members uh, develop new activities, uh, exchange practice, and experience. So the flagship, uh, uh, the flagship activity is the Make You Blue campaign. Uh, it is the campaign that uh, uh, aims to enhance ocean literacy by encouraging individuals and organizations to make a pledge for the ocean. Uh, the EU for Ocean platform, one of the communities, is a focal point for uh, diverse organizations and among its members are academia, our industry, museums, aquariums, their networks, NGOs, but also uh, governmental and public authorities organizations. The members are in many countries in Europe, but also uh, beyond. The young generations are involved in two communities, the Youth for Ocean Forum and the Network of European Blue Schools. The Youth for Ocean Forum is for young people between 16 and 30 years of age, who are passionate about the ocean, and its honorary, honorary member, Virginius Sinkiewicz, is the Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries of the European Commission. The young people are empowered within the Youth for Ocean Forum towards uh, youth advocacy. Uh, to do this, the Youth for Ocean Forum creates them opportunities to speak at diverse international and events and professional meetings to share their ideas, promote projects and connect with like-minded people and experts. There is also a Young Ocean Advocate program uh, where a young people uh, obtain an accreditation of Young Ocean Advocates for their outstanding projects and they can also uh, benefit from coaching and mentoring services to further implement and uh, develop their projects. Uh, one of the uh, most representatives uh, or most representative activities of youth advocacy um, can be uh, the uh, participation of the Youth for Ocean Forum at the Conference of the Parties of the United Conference, the Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change last year, where 12 members were accredited to um, attend the, uh, the COP26, and they uh, contribute and the Youth for Ocean Forum contributed to the site event organized by Global Ocean Forum and, and part Partners, which was entitled Ocean Solutions, Coordination and Collaboration for Ocean-Based Mitigation and Adaptation. They also Okay, apologies for that, but um, unfortunately we have run out of time for this event. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, and again, for the time you put into making your presentations. I'm sure that if anyone has any questions, please do follow us uh, up with the emails that were provided in the presentations uh, and make direct contact. For those of you in the room who wish to ask a question, Tecla will be there and will be able to pass on your questions to anyone who is, uh, to the person you wish to direct that question to. So with that, I would one final thank you to everyone who took the time to, to present today, a truly fascinating event. Thank you to the organizers. And with that, I will pass it back to the room in Bonn. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Um, sorry we had to end it short. Um, uh, Steve mentioned Tekla, that's me. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to make contact, then please come and see me and I'll be happy to follow up for you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. It was great being here virtually.